ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, cluster around the TV. Get your pads of paper out, your pencils out, because there's a lot of stuff you're going to hear today you're going to want to write down. This is the Sports Report. And here's Gary Patterson right here with me to yeah. keep me on the rails and see if I can Can't <clears throat> promise that. get through this. <laughs> Gary, in no particular order, yes. I have got a mess here. Okay. So I'm just going to plow through See a few it. notes over there. Yep. So last night the Bruins played the Florida Panthers. They did. And uh, Frankie Vitrano had... Five goals and three assists going into the game, 17 games played, and Noah Lakari had four goals. I don't know how many assists he had. Um, the Bruins were plus, uh, they were minus 172. So, in other words, you had to bet 172 bucks to make 100. Yeah. And Florida was one, plus 160. Wow. Bet 100, get 160 back. So mentally, believe it or not, I bet the Panthers. Yeah. They won. That's interesting. Yeah, they did. After, uh, by blowing a 4 nothing lead in the third period, I mean, what? at home. Yeah, I mean, that just can't happen. It did. It can't happen. I'll tell you what. They are going through a very rough they spell. Are. Now, they are. They are not an 11-1 and team. No. All right? No, no, no. no. But they're not a let's lose four straight team either, especially under suspicious circumstances. Yeah. I mean, games that uh, man should well, never have gotten away. Yeah. Last two have gone to overtime. And when they get to the three on three overtime, which I love watching, I think that's when they really miss Tori Krug. Krug is very good in, in that situation. Yes, he is. And uh, You're absolutely they, right. He him lacking the last two games. You get Pasternak well. out there, and Marchand out yeah. there, and Tori Krug. You got a lot of creativity. You got out a there. lot. Yeah. Uh, and goal scoring ability. Yeah. And same goes for the power play. Yeah. Quite frankly. Oh yeah. Well yeah. yeah. Um, last night, a strong Celtics effort. Uh, night before last, night actually. Before, yeah. yeah, and I wrote this yesterday. They're playing pretty well. A uh, little disjointed. A um, couple of eh, spots there. But that was a good win. Uh, Jason Tatum went an incredible one for 18. One for 18, yeah. yeah. you got to work. you got to work at doing that. Yeah. I don't see how you do that on by accident. Yeah. Oh, Pazingas was no better. He was one for 11 yeah. on the floor. One for 18, though. I mean, yeah. you just keep chucking them up, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 boy, oh, boy. Like he went one for eight and said, it's not my yeah. night. One for 18. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought Kemble played extremely well. He's been very good. Brown showed up and played well. Smart was. was smart. Uh, he was the stick that stirred the drink, I yeah. think. I love Mark. As you know, and, I love Mark. Yeah, smart. And I, as you know, I like Wanamaker. Yeah. And I thought he came in. Yeah, he's played well. And, and you know what? You just look at it in the stats and, oh, yeah, big deal, 10 points. Yeah, yeah, but he got them at a certain point in the game, and he was good. I uh, I thought he uh, was up there for one of my stars. Attack. Okay. The musings of Kyam Bloom. Um, yes, I'm the Red Sox. Yes, new man, the boss. The boss. Um, so I just want to read a couple of things here. Um, at this uh, early stage, at areas where there isn't an obvious incumbent. I don't think we're really thinking uh, about the specific players in the organization who address a whole in mid-November, Bloom said. I would say to look at it in terms of need A, need B, and need C might be a little limiting for us. To zoom out we know our objective is to prioritize sustainability, prioritize competitiveness, 
not just this coming year, but also in the long term, to think of things through that lens, rather than trying to arrange an order of needs, is how we're approaching it, and it should open up more options for us. Yeah. What a load of well, crap. Yeah. But clearly, I think bringing him in is acknowledging a change of philosophy to some degree. They obviously want to compete, but the current model ain't working. You got the highest payroll, you're in the luxury tax, you got all these contracts around your neck weighing you down. I think the operating model needs to change a little bit. And they, and it starts with rebuilding the farm system. I mean, I hear that. I hear that, and to me, it's like bye-bye Mookie. You know, it's, assuming you can get a pretty respectable haul of young prospects, some basically major league ready, or one or two years in the league already. I mean... Bloom. Because they have nothing coming through the system. What have they got? Dahlbeck. Dahlbeck. Right? Um, Tanner Houck, uh, you've got um, C.J. Chatham. How many um, else are pitchers? The last couple of pitchers? Oh, Tanner Houck is a pitcher. And, and uh, they signed a Chinese kid out of Taiwan who has cracked 100 miles an hour. Okay. But, now, Bloom also said that he and members... Other members of the Red Sox front office ran into the agents for Mookie Betts on Monday and that the team planned to check in with them sure. and numerous other agents again during the GM meetings. While Betts' willingness, or potentially the lack thereof, to discuss a long-term deal one year before he becomes eligible for free agency would appear a significant factor in identifying the path to sustainability, Bloom said that Bet's interest in an extension wasn't necessarily a key factor in Rasta construction. The more clarity you have on the better off you are, but I don't think it's an end-all, be-all, especially at this time of the off-season. Did you ever sit and listen to a line of BS <laughs> from an HR guy? Sure. Boy, yeah. I'm telling you. Yeah. This guy here, would industry is calling out for him. Yeah. What a... I, uh, he talks like an Ivy Leaguer, which he is. So, All the general managers <laughs> If this is the malarkey we are going to be fed, me and Joe Sixpack are not going to be happy. This guy is not talking to Red Sox fans, but to a fate snobs like John Henry. He better learn to speak like a baseball man and talk to the fans in the vernacular they understand, rather than sounding like the chatter that emanates from a Aunt Julia's tea room. So let me clearly say to Mr. Bloom, wise up, buddy, or you'll lose the fans, and the hounds from the radio talk show set will be loosed upon you. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it goes with the territory. It does. So I think the best thing he can do is ignore the noise, quite frankly. I mean, if they hired him because they think he has the skill set, mm. I th again, I think to change the model of how the team a little bit and re help to rebuild the farm system. And, you know, he may lose the fans over the winter, but, you know, if they get, if he makes changes and they come out and they start 15 and 5, <laughs> all bets fine. are off. You're <laughs> absolutely right. But if they start 5 and 15, that's a whole other story. We'll all be and going. He can, and he can be. Joe Sixpack all he wants, and if they start 5-15, and 15, they're going to be howling. That's so right. So we He can, just needs to ignore the noise and do his job. We'll be out in the backyard banging at the moon. <laughs> uh, so, all right, I'm put off by him. 
you're obviously smitten. I would, I would look give, give him some time. He's had the uh, job, what, less than a month? Don't yeah, like this. So, be- I don't like this beginning. Let's talk February 1st. All right. Now, so, um, there. Now, let's see here. I got something here. Uh, okay, here it is. All right. So, tell me something, Gary. Yes, Bill. Could this be the year Evans makes the Hall of Fame? I have no idea who who's in the class. Ah, well, okay. So this is. Um, do you think he's the, a Hall of Famer, Dwight Evans? I do not. Then, all right. Then a very good player, multiple time All Star. I have a high standard for the Hall of Fame, though. I will say that. I well, I tell you what, you and I think I, there's a ton of people in it that shouldn't have been in there. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, well, I tell you what. Look, I, the crap that I just groveled on this. What is the Hall of Fame? It's yeah. for greats, not goods or yeah. very goods. Yeah, I agree. It's for those who dominated. Harold Baines, George High Pockets Kelly. No. Um, I'm guessing, uh, well, this is the Veterans Committee, okay? Um, and you've got some other guys, but you've got Steve Garvey. Tommy John, who, by the way, famous for the operation, but yeah. he was a damn good pitcher. He was a good pitcher, but Don, I, I don't see him as a Hall of Famer. Don Mattingly. Borderline. Thurman Munson. No. No, a tragic end yeah. to a, a no. decent career, but that yeah. doesn't make him a Hall of Famer. Dave Parker. No. Power, but that, that's it. Ted Simmons. No. Very good hitter for a catcher, yeah. but that's it. He's horrible defensively. Lou Whitaker? No. No. Not even uh, close. A good player. Good player. Yep. And former labor law boss Marvin Miller. Um, I uh, will say this. Marvin may get in there. He, he did change yeah, things. Yeah, they, they hate him, though. I know they hate him, yeah. but talk about somebody who had an impact on the game. Holy mackerel. Huge. Huge. <laughs> um, I say, uh, if anybody makes it, uh, by the way, there's 16 guys that will cast ballots, and uh, it's got to, uh, they've got to average out to being mentioned on 12 of the... Oh, wait a minute. I don't think I heard anybody that I would vote for. Well, I, I wrote down Gavi, Mattingly, and Dale Murphy. But um, they ha- they're flawed, all three of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now listen, Gavi did not dominate. No, he had some great moments. But That's right. As did um, Mattingly. Mattingly had a couple of terrific years. Mattingly, three forty, <clears throat> was stuck around for quite a while. Yeah, and was a very good player. Right. Uh, in the spotlight. Yeah. Uh, Dale Murphy had all the equipment to be a Hall of Famer, he did. Be, except for the career. Yeah, he got injured too. Yeah. He got way injured yeah. way too much. So, but he you, had he was a, he was a five tool player. Yeah. I mean, Murphy yeah, well, was no, when no he question. was healthy and when he was young and he was healthy. Yeah. So he, he was a Hall of Fame talent, but yeah. he didn't. I think if anybody makes it, it'll be Mattingly. Maybe the Yankee connection. Yeah, the Yankees. And- yep. Yeah. Now, interesting. Now, Dan, Dan Shaughnessy. I've never liked Dan Shaughnessy. Okay. At all. Yeah, I could take him or leave him. Um, but um, Harold Baines, no way, got into the Hall of I Fame. I Tony would... Larusa and uh, the owner of the White Sox, Reinsdorf. Yeah, huh. uh, supposedly pressured the voters, and Larusa did well, a lot of yeah legwork. I think Harold that goes on every Baines. Day. Yeah, Harold Baines should not have been there. <laughs> not again. I mean, he was. His best years were as a DH. Yeah. And he was a solid DH. He was good. I mean, he was an all-star caliber DH. That, that doesn't but make that doesn't him put a you Hall, Hall of Famer. Famer. In my mind. No. And uh, the the calendar boy for this category is George High Pockets Kelly. George High Pockets Kelly. Played for the old St. Louis Cardinals back in the 20s and 30s. Okay. Big friends 
was Frankie Frisch, uh, the Fordham Flash. Huh. And Frankie ran the Veterans Committee, ran it with an iron hand, mm. and he put his friend, George Kelly, into the Hall of Fame. No Korea. kidding. Yeah. You take a look sometimes. Get a baseball encyclopedia at home. I'll go on the Baseball internet. reference. Yeah. yeah. Take a look at George Kelly's career. Hmm. Ah, uh, boy, I'm High telling pockets, you. Huh? That was his High nickname, pockets. High Pockets? High Pockets, yeah. yeah like he was 6'3 or so, you know? <laughs> High Pockets. Uh, I think he played third base and first base. But I don't see... Listen, I suppose a dispassionate point of view, if there's such a thing as possible, that if Mattingly got her elected... The second choice probably should be Evans, but I don't think it's going to happen because yeah. he fails the great test. Yeah, yeah. Dewey was a good player. I mean, he was a great defensive player, yeah. good great. arm. Yep. Yeah. And you know, he was, was up and down over his career. He had some good. Right. He had some very good offensive years. Yeah. And but then he, he had some power years. Not consistent like, yeah. for fifteen That's exactly years right. or something. Yeah. 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 So I don't see it. I don't see it either. But. I wouldn't put any of them in that I just heard. You know what? I would tend to agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Don Cherry being fired yeah. for practicing freedom of speech. Yeah, I saw that. that I saw him uh, being interviewed last night, actually, when Tucker Carlson had him on. Yep. You people love, you that come here, Whatever it is, you love our way of life. Yeah. You love our milk and honey. At least you could pay a couple of bucks for a poppy or something like that. These guys paid for your way of life that you enjoy in Canada. These guys paid the biggest price. That's hate speech? Yeah. I think it was the you people. According to Don Cherry, it was the That's right. the you people. That got him fired. If he had said everybody instead of you people, they wouldn't have fired him, which well, is absurd in and absurd of itself. It's like, are you because me? you people can cover anybody, Any, right? Well, you can define you people as ones with blue eyes, yeah, ones with gray hair, yeah, ones that limp. I mean, what does you people mean? They're saying it means immigrants. Yeah. Uh, because he says, you come here, you love our way of life, you love our milk and honey, at least you could pay a couple of bucks for a poppy or something like that. I mean, they he want to control speech. expressed his honest opinion. I get no problems yeah. with it. Because I do, perhaps I agree, perhaps I don't agree. I don't know. But I will say this. I will that he has got the right to say what he uh, feels. And to fire him over it is a supreme act of cowardice by the Canadian Broadcasting Company. Yeah, 38 years, I think he said yeah. he was doing that. Divisive remarks. Give me a yeah. break. I mean, we have gone from tell it like it is to, oh, you can't say yeah. that. You know, and everybody's a victim. Uh, um, it, 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 uh, the classic example is kids' soccer in school. Well, we don't keep school because, well, you know, if one team wins and the other one loses, the team that loses feels icky about themselves. Yeah. Oh, God. So we're going to protect Kids from ickiness. Right. Yeah. So uh, make sure we to have an adult running around after the kids to pick them up before they fall, you know? Yeah. Catch them in midair because you don't want them to so skin a knee. Have they driven the competitiveness out of those kids? Because when we were kids, it wouldn't have mattered what they were saying. We would have been competitive. We all would have been keeping score on the field. 
Wait. Right? You know the kids you're playing. You're all in the same town. Can you imagine the stuff that we sent back and oh forth my to each other while we were playing? You don't think those kids are thinking, oh, we're up, we're, after the game, they're getting together and saying, hey, we won, four to two. We huh. won. And they can't, they have to say it quietly because it's politically incorrect to compete and to want to, and as part of competing as a team with your teammates to take joy in winning, that's now a bad thing. Teaching teamwork and because responsibility. The other team, Isn't that wonderful? But, you know, there's value to the kids who lose and the fact that they're in a team. Mm-hmm. And they're on a team that they came up short and lost the game. And they can emotionally deal with that together and support each other and all that stuff. And then try to improve as a team before the next game. Exactly right. And that's, to me, one of the values of, of, course. of youth sports. Yes, there's a winner and a loser in the game. Sure. You're taught but to win, and that's the big rub. Yeah. You should not be uh, playing to win. You should be playing to have fun. Right. And when the kids lose, they don't have fun. They right. want... Then they have more fun the next game when they actually win. That's right. When and they, they say, realize... Oh, winning is actually... More fun than when, losing. When they realize that hard work and practice translates into wins, yeah, that's a life lesson. It is a life lesson. So, you know, when I was in the army, and I told the story, I think on the other show, but um, we went out in the field, and sergeant said to me, I was closest to him. Pick up that telephone pole. I said, but it don't butt me. Get your butt over there and pick up that telephone pole. Grunting and groaning. I couldn't pull it. He says, to the next guy in line, he says, get over there and help him. Pick up that telephone pole. Nothing. Anyway, we got 10 or 12 guys over there. And guess what? We picked it up. Yeah. What's the lesson? Right. Teamwork. Teamwork. It's a squad that stays together wins the battles. Which is huge in the military, obviously. Uh, yeah. yeah. And you know, um, it is. But it's uh, big in life. It's big in life. I was talking on the plane, uh, on a flight, to a buck sergeant, um, big kid, maybe 6'4 or so. And he was going home to Kentucky. And... Um, So how long have you been in? Blah, blah, blah. So bottom line, he said, I'm going home to think about re-upping. He said, I haven't made up my mind. I want to go home and talk to my dad and explain the situation to him. I said, what do you think the odds are? He said, I think I would like to re-up and stay in the Army, but we have a family business. and Well, I, I want to talk to dad. Very mature young man. Yeah. So um, we get talking about different things. And he was in Somalia, Mogadishu. Uh-huh. And he said, uh, we were talking about, I said, have you seen combat and stuff? And yeah, yeah. He said, it's worse than you can think of. Yeah. It's terrible. He said, and then he those bastards, he said, would gather the women and children in the street and hide behind them. Huh. And when we were coming into the, the, the village, they start shooting at us from behind the women and children. Wow. I said, what did you do? He said, I had to protect my men, my squad. He said, we mowed them down. Women, children, and bad guys. Wow. That's a tough spot He to be had in. that teamwork. My guys. Yeah. My squad. That was first and foremost. Yeah. Otherwise, he's, you know, we could stand there and be killed. That right. was the... That was the choice. That was the choice. Yeah. 
And I often remember that when I think about teamwork and all that. That was his first thought. I got to take care of my team. Mm -hmm. It was Harry Truman's first thought, too. Yeah. About dropping the bombs. Yeah. Oh, listen. Um, you're going to lose a million men going into Japan. Or we'll you lose take out, none. You know, yeah, yeah <laughs> you'll lose none, and a lot of civilians will die. That's right. Close down to the war. Right. Not going to send. And I, read, I remember uh, reading uh, his biography, and you know he had. He said it really. He had no regrets, and he said it wasn't even a tough decision. No. People say, "How do you make that decision?" He said it wasn't a tough decision. It no. was. We were going to lose a million young kids, or they were. Yeah. And the ancillary uh, damage would be the civilians would starve to death. Yeah. While we tried to take the island. Right. Because they would feed the army right. to fight us, but the civilians, would. we had a blockade, we, right. and they would die. So how many of them would die, too? Right. It was a horrible situation. And Truman, listen to the military, listen to the experts, and you're right. It wasn't a hard decision. It wasn't decision. a hard decision for no. him. No. Um... The Mets have hired Carlos Beltran. Wow, that's interesting. As manager. Yeah. And uh, the Cubs hired David Ross, neither one of whom has any experience managing. Right. Now. Both played a long time, though. Yes. Now, Beltran, um, as the Major League Baseball segues, to robot managers for the analytic computer jockeys to push their button. And Ross is in the same situation. Uh, is this what we're going to find, do you think? Uh, you don't need a baseball um, well, IQ I mean, because Ross, we're going to yeah. do it for you. Well, in the case of Ross, I think he's fully indoctrinated into the Cubs system, right? He's been in the front office the last couple mm -hmm. of years since he retired. Yep. So he's been upstairs with Theo and his team, integrate, fully integrated with them. So he gets it. He's their guy. And to the degree of, is he going to let analytics drive his decision-making? Absolutely. Of course he is. That's, yep. that's going to take that's so much of the spontaneity out of the sport. It's already, it's already happened. <coughs> oh, I know it has. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I know. And we don't know how much it's happened because the Red Sox won't talk about it. It's a big secret. Yeah. But Alex I want to know is, about the team that is down in A ball coaching their hitters, not only to yank the ball out of the park, but to be able to slap the ball through these holes and these shifts, you know, and develop that skill. So when you come up and you got two on, two out, the entire left side of the infield is open, you can just slap it through there. Yeah. You know, I look at these shifts and I wonder, you know, if they would have dared to shift Wade Box. Because Wade Box would have done that. Wade Box would have been able to just slap through the holes. I mean, he would sit there and just foul pitches off till he got one to hit. And I agree. You know, what yeah. team is gonna be forward looking enough to say, you know what? We got an answer for this shift thing. And it's going to be that we're going to, by the time our kids get to the major leagues, they're going to know, choke up a little cutback, slap it through the hole. All you got to do is get it on the ground. It's going through. Mm -hmm. Right? Get it to the right side of the infield, left side and, of the infield, whatever. You know. But get it over there. Every All these shifts now. And the hitters just continue to hit the way they're hitting, and they just hit into the shifts. When you're programmed to do right. something... And you're saying you've got to uppercut the ball. Right. Guess what? They can't change. Right. Uh, and if they did free well, What team is going to realize that there's, in the evolving state of strategy, there's now a hitting strategy that needs to be developed to go after this defensive so strategy? You've got to draft smaller guys, let's say smaller guys, with back control. Yeah. Over 
big muscle bound sluggers that can hit it about you know, seven well, yeah, miles. Ideally, you got both, right? And it's situational. Yeah. You know, there are times you want Mookie Betts swinging. For, and Mookie's a guy who's capable of doing this, right? He's a good enough back control guy. I think he is. I think he is, too. But, and that the home run doesn't have to be the answer every time. But um, I don't see Xavier, um, Xander Bogats being able to do that. That's Yeah. Um, and I, I think it, it's crazy uh, to think Rafi Devas can do it at this point in his career. Right. By the time they get to the major leagues, it's too late. Yeah. I'm saying develop that as they come through your system. I a think, ball, double A, I think, triple A. I, I think you're cooking with gas. And just start slapping hits through these shifts. Yeah. And that's going to totally screw these guys up when people start doing that. <laughs> What's interesting, changing the subject, he said uh, momentarily, but still staying the song, sort of the same, is the Red Sox are talking in the paper today that um, JBJ is gone. Yeah, I think he is. Yeah. They don't. Want, they say his arbitration number is going to be eleven million dollars, which is ridiculous. They, they, eleven million dollars for yeah. a, a good defensive, outfield. an outstanding defensive center fielder. But that's about it. That's it. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, he's hit a miss. You would never trust him to hit to the other field. God, he can't control the bat as it is. Um, okay, I got one more thing on this piece of paper. I go to a baseball card show. Is mm-hmm. the title of this talk. Down Mansfield, at the Holiday Inn, every other Sunday or every third Sunday, there's a baseball card show. Hmm. Um, and autograph show. Now, they had Rico Petroselli. They had um, in two Bruins. Oh, Jerry Cheevas. Cheesy. Yeah. And they had uh, one of the, uh, Kelly, that was on the Stanley Cup team. Okay. Chris Kelly. Chris Kelly. Yeah. So, I'm standing beside this guy because I wanted to talk to him. And he also, and I think he may be the guy that is the manager of the show, because he was selling the tickets Mm -hmm. for... um, Oh, you want two Rico Petroselli autographs? Okay. Um, you want them personalized? Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, so that's 23 bucks. For Rico? Yeah. Wow. Um, oh, you want a Rico picture too? So I think what that was it. Yeah, the, all, those three things combined was 23, so two of them is 46. So that's what the guy bought, 46 huh. bucks. Wow. Chivas, I think, was the same, but I'm not sure of that. Now, I've got Jerry Chivas' autograph. I got it at a couple of different shows. I have quite a few of his autographs. But I have a picture of him. I would like to get autographed. And I thought to myself, I had to bring it, and if I can get it done for 10 bucks, then so be it. Yeah. So it was way out of sight. Huh. So I'm talking to this guy. And uh, people are coming up and money out. Really? This guy was raking the money in. Wow. Ah, big bucks. That's amazing. Yeah. So I went out into the, the, this was uh, in an aisle before the big ballroom. So... He was at the entrance. Mm-hmm. So that's what makes me think he was uh, maybe the show manager. Yeah. Because he was peddling the pictures and the tickets both. Uh, quite a pile of money there in the box in wow. front of him. I, I think I would have had somebody with me watching the box. Lucrative business. Mm. Cash business, too. No so I went out there and they had, I don't want to exaggerate, but they had at least 40 booths. Huh. Guys peddling cards and autographs. <coughs> so these people are frantically running around. Hey, hey, you! You want to sell some cards? I, I spent $5,000 here at the last show. I got $5,000 in my pocket. Show me your cards. What do you want to sell me? Wow. Is that right? Yeah. 
And I said, just hold on to your horses there, pal. I'm not selling anything. I'm looking to buy. I got stuff for sale, too. I said, yeah, okay, good. Huh. So. A rather robust scene, it sounds like. Yes, it is. And a fair amount of old cards. Yeah. Far fewer than I would have thought. But I'm talking about 1949 Bowmans. Okay. 52 tops and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But a lot of autographs. Huh. So um, I had gone down there because I had two packets of Bruins uh, postcards uh, from 1970 or 71. Uh, And there was like 22 or 23 uh, color, three by five pictures. Stapled together on glossy, thick paper. Uh-huh. I paid 25 cents for each package. Um, they sold them the year before. They were the year before's uh, cards. And I think they were like a dollar a piece. And I, I bought some and I tore them apart and got them autographed. But I go back to the first game of the season, the following season, I had season tickets then. They were selling last year's set of cards, 25 cents a pack. So wow. I bought two packs, brought them home. So I said to the guy, I told him what I had, and he says, yeah, yeah. He says, those are good, those are good. I said, what are they worth? He said, no, nah, 60 bucks. Wow. A piece. 60 bucks a piece? Yeah. That's a good investment on 25 cents. Yeah. So um, I said, and what's a uh, Speed Johnson, who's who in baseball, 1935 worth? That's a, a book. Yeah. It's got a picture of everybody in the majors. Huh. Um, he said, don't even know what that is. So this guy is ma- modern stuff. Yeah, yeah. So he said, bring it in. He got it out in the car, bring it in. I'll give you a price, you know. So um, he offered me 60 bucks for the pair. Um, and I'm saying to myself, well, hell, if he buys them, how long before he sells them? That's what I'd offer somebody to would be half, you know. Yeah. So I said, nah, thanks. I said, I'll, uh, if, I, if I decide I want to sell them, I want to ask my son if he wants them. But if I decide to sell them, I'll bring them back to the next show. He gave me his card. He looked at Speed Johnson, and he said, I've never seen anything like this before. He said, I don't know what to tell you. Huh. He said, I don't know, five bucks? I said, I, or, I turned down 75. Yeah. He says, yeah. He says, you're a wise man. Yeah. And he handed it back to me. But um, the, the bottom line, Gary, a lot of money changing hands. Yeah. A lot of it. That's and amazing. A, and a lot of squirrely people. Yeah. <laughs> so I said to myself, you know what? Next time I get down, I'm going to give you a call. Huh. You might like that. Yeah, it might be an interesting uh, afternoon or yeah. evening. Yeah. Yeah. Morning. Morning. Sunday morning. Sunday morning. Nine to uh, three. Huh. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And they usually have two or three autograph guests. Huh. And, uh, but you'll look at a lot of stuff and say, geez, I had that. I and know. Uh, that could be painful. Now, I did screw up and I couldn't get in to see what this was all about, but I listened. And I heard the guy say, how about this one? It was a card. He had individual cards laid out. And he said, how about the?" And he named the guy, and I couldn't hear it. And uh, the guy says, 1,400. 1,400? Yeah, for one guy. Wow. So the guy says, Yikes. Yeah, I'll give you 13. Guy says, sold. Huh. The next thing you know, this guy's pulling out hundreds. Yeah, counting out hundred dollar bills. Yeah, and I couldn't see what the card was. Wow, it was under pl- under plastic, and I wasn't going to ask the guy after the other guy left, you know. But that was some mighty expensive crap in there. Yeah, apparently. Yeah, interesting. So I'll give you a haul on next time That's there's a show and tell you who's down there and see if you want to come with me. Um, do you think, now this story here is by Peter Abraham, who, by the way, um, when Nick, um, 
Uh, Kfara. Kfara died. We lost an awful lot. Yeah. I thought Peter Abraham would step up to the plate and do a little bit more. He's not. No. No. He's a slug. He's he's a, a Red Sox button, they push. Yeah. Give me the talking points. Yep. Yeah. So he is conjecturing that the Red Sox would look to move sale and price both. Well, you know what? I think everybody in Boston would agree that would be a good deal. Yeah. But I think it's totally unrealistic. I don't know. Supposedly the Rangers are interested in price, have interest. You know, they, the Rangers, the way, I read an article on this mm-hmm. because I couldn't believe it could actually be true. The Rangers want a veteran pitcher. They want to, they're going to talk to Garrett Cole. They're going to talk to uh, Strasburg. They're going to talk to whoever number three is, I forget. But they're convinced they're not going to be able to get those guys because there's other more desirable teams. Cole's going to end up in the West Coast. I'm convinced they're not going to get them, right. too. But they want one of those guys. They've got the payroll to cover it. They've, yeah. you know, yeah. And one of the people they're supposedly interested in is David Price. Over Chris Sale? I don't know about over Chris Sale, but, but this article was that price. they have inquired about Price. Well, you know, that would be a dream come true. If you didn't have to eat any money, it would yeah. be a dream come true. Yeah. If you still get to carry some money on the books, then it's not as good as it looks. Right. Um, because. But that's the thing. Supposedly they've got salary space. See, I wonder. And if- they want a guy, a veteran, top of the rotation type guy. So, you know, maybe Price is that, maybe he's not. He hasn't looked like, didn't look like it last year. Maybe his, you could get him to take the whole enchilada if you threw in a top prospect with him. I don't know. You know, this thing, this article was talking about Texas. They they are desperate for a this, huh? for a pitcher for a top tier pitcher, hmm. and they they don't think they can get one in free agency. They don't think they're going to be in that, those discussions. And so now it comes down to trade. Who can you trade for? And, you know, it's not a long list. Mm-hmm. Right. And Price is somebody that maybe they roll the dice on. You know, if you're willing to take the money, it's not going to cost you a lot of prospects to take them. No. No. And, in fact. You know, maybe that dice roll comes up a seven. Maybe Price comes back healthy. He's still, he's not over, over the hill. I mean, a best-case scenario, he comes back and wins them 18 games. 14. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what they be want. Than and the they're willing to pay $30 million a year for it. Well, you know, if they're willing to pick up the whole tab, yeah, and we threw in, say, C.J. Chatham. I'm not sure who, you got to throw in anybody. Well, you may have to, because if you want them to eat it all, um, you may have to send, throw in somebody. Now, Chatham is probably not going to find a place to play in Boston right away. He's a shortstop, and he can hit, um, and he can field. Um, and he's working his way up to the system. Now, he'll be down AAA, hmm. and um, he's like the number two or three prospect in the Red Sox. Right. Um, but So if you threw him Well, in, being able to pull something like that off is the only way you, know, you can even remotely consider it. Yeah. Sign and pass. And, so, and, and what does Texas have in excess of? An outfielder? Yeah. Yeah. Got some so players. maybe you could, maybe you could you get, get an, an outfielder. outfielder back. Yeah. And, and that would be it. And if you could ever offload that $90 million, man, you're a long ways towards that $208 magic mark. Yeah. I mean, that would be pulling a rabbit out be, of the hat. Yeah. I, I'd be thrilled with that. I'll tell you. Um, sale is another story. I don't know. I mean, hell, he started yeah. a five-year contract, and he hasn't gotten through a season yet, right? Dominant when he's out there, Would, but is, yeah. how long is he going to be out there? Uh, the Celtics and Gordon Hayward. Yeah, he was off to a great start till he got oh, hurt. Oh, was he ever? Yeah. The game before, I mean, he was just absolutely outstanding. Yeah. And... Moving the ball around, directing traffic with the, in the offense, jumping, gee, Um 
What a shame. So we'll see how, I mean, he's going to be back. I mean, he'll be back before the first of the year, right? And it's Six a hand weeks. injury. It's not a leg injury. Yeah. It's and it's a, his off hand. It's his off hand. Yep. So, you know, he should be fine. By yep. end of January, he should be rolling. Yep. Maybe he'll have some fresh leg, legs come April. Sounds good to me. You know. Um, Mookie Betts. Uh, what Shaughnessy did was he wrote a column about Mookie Betts. Yeah. And basically said, Mookie's leaving. So what? He's not that good anyway. Yeah, he's good. but Well, they he pointed out Freddie Lynn and um, Noma Garcia Parra. Yeah. And he looked at the amount of games they played and the the amount of games that Mookie's played. And the, it, let's just say it was 450 games or yeah. something like yeah. that. And compared their stats for the first 450 games, well, Noma won four of the six categories. Huh. Um, and Freddie the Lynn right. won one. Yeah. And Betts won one. Yeah. Yeah, we've talked before on the show that we may very well have already seen his career year. Yeah. We may never see last year again. You know, uh, now Noma had a huge year when he hit 372. Right. Yeah. And that was early in his career, too. Now, he got short circuited due to injuries, but. And steroids. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. No question. Um, so. J.D. Martinez, a story in the paper this morning. Um, thinking of places they can trade J.D. Martinez to in this 23.75 mil. Right. Well. You know, I think. I think if you trade Mookie, you got to keep him. You think? Yeah. But I don't think we're going to compete. Do you? Yeah. If we, well, if we move price and... It depends what you get back. Yeah. I mean, if it's suddenly you're freeing up, I think you're freeing up money. You know, fifty, sixty million go. dollars. You're not going to put it back in circulation. We got to get down to two oh eight, and then get below that to add yeah. to it. Um, but he's going to be well. You know, I still want to trade Mookie to the Phillies for Aaron Nola. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good luck on that yeah. one. We might have to dress it up a little bit, but yeah. Um, so sell them on having Bryce Harper and Mookie. That would be one heck of a one, too. I'll yeah. tell you. Um, study CTE increases the more football you play. Wow, wow, a isn't that a shocker, huh? Yeah. Uh, but boy, I'll tell you this. Uh, well, yeah, it's interesting that what came out about the girls' soccer because I've always wondered about that ever since I coached youth soccer and the heading. And I remember I didn't play soccer as a kid. And I remember my, I had an assistant coach from here in town who what, had been a soccer player. And so I had him give me, you know, instruct me so I can instruct the kids. Yep. And I remember when we were doing, heading the ball and saying, geez, that hurts. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Why don't they allow them to wear helmets? I don't know. I think that's coming. I think it's coming. And now they, they just a study just came out about girls' soccer, girls' youth soccer, and the concussion rates are very high, and it's from heading. It's like, hey, hello. Yeah, they got they got to put helmets on them. I think so. I mean, girls, just uh, softball players wear the masks and all yeah. of that, and the sport has survived beautifully. Yeah. Kids uh, don't even ride a bike anymore without no, a helmet. I know it. I know it. When we were kids, no, nobody had a helmet. Nobody had a helmet. A if you helmet? had a helmet, you were a sissy. Yeah. Uh, so, Riley Smith, I'm glad we dumped him. To, <laughs> he's got 10 goals now. Does he? Yeah. yeah. Well, they come. And come. here's a, a heartbreak of the Chicago Cubs have assigned Alan Webster to the Iowa AAA farm. He came up. And was a fireballer and yeah. has yeah. had a series of failures. Um, you are the king of the world. Okay. About time. Yep. Yeah. And we are playing the Russians. Okay. For the title of the world. Okay. And it's championship 
the championship of professional football. Now, you're the coach as well as the king of all sports. Okay. Your quarterback goes down. You can pick any FL quarterback you want for one game. The championship of the world. Championship of the world. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't have to worry about longevity, age. Who would you pick? I'm taking Brady. He's been there, done that. Really? Yeah. For one game? Yeah. And, and I'm assuming I've got weapons for him to use. Oh, yeah. Then give me Brady. Who else wins big games? And even, you know, the ones that he lost, he led his team to fourth quarter go-ahead touchdowns, and his defense gave All it right. up. On well, I didn't losses. know you were that much of a Patriots fan. I'm not a Patriots fan. I'm a, if, you, if i got to win the game, give me a guy who, who's been there. Give me All a guy right. who knows how to do it. I'll do this another way. You also, your backup quarterback fell down the stairs and broke his leg. Now you got to have a backup to Brady. Yeah, I'll take Rodgers. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Aaron Rodgers was my number one choice. Yeah. Uh, I've. Okay. Yeah. Uh, retiring numbers. The yeah. Celtics have a problem with retiring numbers. Yeah, they're going to run out of numbers. That's, that's essentially <laughs> it. You know? So, would they reissue retired numbers? Well, I don't think they would dare to do it. No, I don't think The Bruins you know. tried it uh, when they got... Um, Oh, uh, the Montreal defenseman at the end of his career and gave him number five, uh, Dick Clapper's old number. Yeah. And uh, that did not resonate well with the Clapper family. And yeah. I mean, you've got the list of numbers, and there's yep. a lot of numbers on there. This is just like the Hall of Fame discussion we had a half an hour ago, right? I mean, there's guys on there. You know, Lasky, really? Jim Leskatov, really? Oh, uh, he protected yeah. Kuzi. Don Nelson. Don Nelson. Don Nelson was a great player when he was here. In the clutch. You yep. know, uh, but yep. retire his number? Mm-hmm. Um, even playing a little devil's advocate, Easy Ed McCauley. Easy Ed McCauley. Was he great? No. Yeah. But he was early. Casey and, Jones? But, yeah. Casey was a great defensive, a great defensive player, player, but he was He's Russell's a, friend. Yeah. By the way, I finished the book... Kuzi and Russell. Yeah. The last pass. Yeah. Neither one of them come across particularly well. Is that right? Yeah. You know, it's a book you should read. Yeah, it's at the library. That'd be an interesting um, And uh, also the league is at Yes, I remember you uh, talking about that. The league is very good. Uh, it's written in the vernacular of a high school school teacher. It's, it's, it's just nothing great about the writing, yeah. but the story is great. Yeah, yeah. I'd be interested it in that. It really is good. The League. The League, yeah. Uh, in fact, I'll write them both down for you when we're done. Uh, but um, Kuzi comes through as a very, very troubled man. Yeah. I, I, he didn't do enough for Russell when Russell broke in. Yet he did for Chuck Cooper and for Don Boxdale, I think it was, the two black guys they had before huh. Russell. So um, he really went to bat for them, but he felt that Russell pushed him away. And, and he might have. And it was, yeah. It was basically, well, screw him then. You know, if I can't deal with him, the heck with him. I won't yeah. deal with him, you know. And it lasted their entire lifetime. That's too bad. Though. That's too and bad. And Kuzi saw Russell at a, a thing. Now, they're both headed for uh, yeah, Boot they, Hill. Yeah, that's sure Kuzi's are. sick, and Russell's very sick. And Kuzi went over and hugged him and said, big guy, how are you? Russell would not look at him or talk to him. That's too bad. Yeah. It's a shame. So that's really. a lousy way for the book to end. But there's a lot in the middle. And 
Um, Ed McCauley's got a great quote in there, too. He said, you know, we're talking about discrimination, about the inability of blacks to break in to the NBA. Um, blacks can be bigots, too. Yeah, well, it's a two-way street. Yeah, yeah. But that's a, a fascinating book. Third book for you, Tuesdays with Maury. Yeah, have you ever read that one? I, no, I have not. I've heard about it. I heard it's excellent. Yeah, and that's at the library. Huh. Now, um, the first part of it is maudlin. It, it, not a man's book. Then it grows on you. Huh. And as Maury is dying, the book becomes quite intense. And it's worth reading. I've heard it's and, good. And you know what? You can plow through it in two hours. Is that right? Yeah, it's, it's 180 pages. And in multiple chapters, Yeah, um, an incident is a chapter. You know, it's a very easy book to read. Huh. Um, so I don't know about retiring numbers. I'm not a big fan of it. Yeah. Um, I think there's a couple of teams that uh, have um, the uh, circle Mm -hmm. of uh, greats or something like that, but they don't retire the number. Yeah. But the guys are there and pictures of them and all of that at the stadium. I think that's a much more intelligent way to do it, to be yeah. honest with you. Um, and, and, like, for instance, uh, my favorite story on that, the Hartford Whalers. Well, they had Pie McKenzie at the end of his career for like a year and a half. And Gordy Howe, went there with Bobby Hull and yeah. played a few games. They retired Howe and Pye McKenzie's numbers. Huh. Just to have some to have retire. Yeah. 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 Well, listen, we covered a lot of ground, and uh, I'll call through this so that next time we could perhaps have it in a more proper order. Um, Massachusetts, for the hub of the universe, Massachusetts... We can certainly behave weirdly. Sports <laughs> reporting. Don Osillo fired. Dave O'Brien hired. Yeah. Jack Edwards in his nonsensical act on the Bruins. And Glenn Ordway, Christian Faria, and Lou Maloney show. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Well. I don't know. A lot of airtime to fill, you know? <laughs> That's it. Well, listen, folks. Hope you enjoyed. <clears throat> all of this uh, nonsense and we'll tune in again to see what we can uh, drive you crazy with next time until then we'll see you later go pats go pats yeah go pats it's right.